It's over. God has won. It's just a matter of time before it all gets cleaned up. It just is, and there, because there's nothing he can do about it. Nothing. Do you understand that? Nothing. It's over. Jesus is one. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And we are a part of that kingdom, my brothers and sisters. We are a part of that kingdom as long as we stay in a state of grace. That's how we stay faithful to our Lord against the darkness in this world. Okay. So, I've got to take you to the catechism on this. This is just too important not to. Because you don't want to listen to the gospel according to Chip. You want to listen to the gospel according to our Lord and through his church. So, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 385. There's paragraph 7, all about the fall. Let's read through this. God is infinitely good. Did you hear that? Yes. And all his works are good. Yes. If you ever had any doubts, there it is. Yet, no one can escape the experience of suffering or evil in nature which seems to be linked to the limitations proper to creatures. And above all, the question of moral evil. Where does evil come from? I sought whence evil comes and there was no solution, said St. Augustine. So we're talking about his mother's feast day today and his feast day tomorrow. So that's one of the statements that St. Augustine said about this. And his own painful quest would only be resolved by his conversion to the living God. For the mystery of lawlessness is clarified only in the light of the mystery of our religion. The revelation of divine love. There it is again. Have you noticed this theme that keeps coming up in, even in the catechism? It's love. This whole thing is about love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life why god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved The revelation of divine love in Christ manifested at the same time the extent of evil and the superabundance of grace. We must therefore approach the question of the origin of evil by fixing the eyes of our faith on him who alone is its conqueror. Did you hear that? So to figure out why is there evil in the world, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because he is the one that's going to explain it all, ultimately. Now, I'm going to jump through some of this to get to the more relevant part, but by all means, you should go back and read this. Uh, here it is. I want to start here. Are you ready? Look at this. Paragraph 390. The account of the fall in Genesis 3. Right? What does it say? Didn't I just state that in here? Mm -hmm. Uses figurative language, but what? A deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. So something happened then. What exactly? We don't know. We don't know. But our faith tells us that there was a primeval event, a test of early man and woman, and they failed. Got it? So don't believe in the talking serpent business and the fruit from the tree. You don't have to. The catechism itself, right here, tells us that our account in Genesis 3 is telling us a real event, but in figurative language. 
Got it? So take a pill on this whole idea of do you believe in talking snakes? Ugh. <laughs> Revelation gives us the certainty of faith that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. Did you hear that? That's what we need to believe. Now, I love this part about the fall of the angels, but I'm going to skip it because it's not relevant to what we're talking about right now. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. God does not want robots. No one's going to be dragged into heaven kicking and screaming. You have to want to be with God. You got that? You don't want to be with God? Fine. You don't have to be. From the beginning. Okay? Free will. Free will. And quite honestly, I don't know about you, but again, let's think in terms of human relationship. Do you want to be with someone that doesn't want to be with you? No, no. <laughs> Have you been with people that are just all over you and it's like, get away from me. I don't, I, I, it just is not working, honey. Move on. Other fish in the sea. Right? Right. You see, we think that's silly, right? But somehow, for God, everyone has to be in heaven. No, they don't. Not if they don't want to be. And frankly, in terms of human relationships, God doesn't want you either. You don't want to be with me? Fine, go. Yes? And again, if we translate this into human relationships, it makes sense. You don't want to be with someone that doesn't want to be with you. So God is no different in that respect. We have to want to love God. We have to want to be with him. We have to, we have to make these gestures back. And how do we do that? We fall in love with God because he's in love with us. Already. You don't have to convince God to love you. He loved you when you were a sinner. Even while we were yet sinners, John, 1 John 4, 4 said, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to show us the extent of his love. Do you understand that? So you don't have to win God's affection. He was in love with you before you were in love with him. And remember, God chose you. You didn't choose him. He told that to his disciples. Remember? Yes. Luke 10, 13. I chose you. You didn't choose me. So let's remember who's loving who first in all of this. And our only response is to love him back. That's the only natural thing to do. Romans 12.1 says, We are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship, or in some translation says, our reasonable service. It's just reasonable to give ourselves back to God, who's loved us so much and has given himself for us. It's just reasonable. And the only reason we don't is because we think of God as something other than this loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing but good for us from the beginning. All right? Three ninety-seven. Man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his crea Creator die in his heart. Did you hear that? The sin of Adam and Eve wasn't the picking of the fruit and eating it. It began in their heart when they decided they didn't want what God had wanted for them. They wanted them for themselves. Okay? 
That's where sin begins, in the heart, in the passions of man, not in the action. That's the result of the sin in the heart. You lust for a woman in your heart first, then you commit the act of adultery. You see? Jesus taught us that. Right? Where does the adultery begin? In the bedroom or in the heart? Heart. heart. So guess where you stop the adultery? In the heart. You stop the affection and you stop the attack. You see that? And that's the essence of our story of temptation and sin. And I better move along, otherwise we're going to miss that part. I really want to get to that part. But this stuff in the catechism is just so good. It's not something that you normally read. But it's something that is the very essence of what this story is all about. Do you see how the wisdom of the church is here for us? All we have to do is open up and understand where to find it. And we can answer all of these questions to people that think otherwise about the church as something other than this instrument of God's love for all of mankind. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. If you think that way now, then you've misunderstood God. You see what I'm saying? God loves you and he wants to be with you. And he doesn't want to share you with anybody or anything else. He loves you that much. Oh, if you only knew the love. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I'm more and more convinced. If we only knew the love of God, if we could just experience it for a little bit, we wouldn't sin as much as we do. I wouldn't say ever, but we certainly wouldn't do it as much or as frequently. If we only knew, I mean knew, how God loves us. I mean, we, 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 we couldn't help but fall in love with him back. And, and, and we wouldn't do the things that we do. Sin would lose its glow, its glamour. You know? This, and and I, I think of that song again. I've sung it before, but it's worth saying. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Those angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. When we fall in love with God, this world loses its luster. It just, just, just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not as shiny and pretty anymore. It just isn't. Sin loses its glow. It's not, it's, it's not fun. Because God loves you. But if you don't think that about it, if you think he's some ogre, he's some judge, if he's just waiting to get you out of line once so he can send you to hell for all eternity. Well, that's a God I don't want to serve. That sounds awful. Doesn't it? That's Do you want to serve a God like that? No. I don't. That's the lies the devil. That's exactly it. That's what I'm getting at. Those are the lies that we've been told. See, we've, we've been lied to. We've got to get back to our scriptures and our catechism. It's been here since the beginning. We just, I don't know, we just haven't, we haven't cared enough to read it because we know what God says. I know what God says. Mean old guy up in town just waiting for me to say I better go to church. I better do all this. I better do this. I, I, I better, I better, I better, I better. Otherwise, it's hell for all eternity. This is an awful way to live. It's an awful way to live. And quite honestly, from a non Catholic point of view looking in, this is how they view Catholics. This is how I view them, is that Catholics are so scared and earning their salvation because they don't know that they're going to heaven or not, and they better do all these good works, otherwise God's going to throw them into hell or purgatory, that they're going to work like a beaver because if they don't, God's going to smack them and send them into hell. And it's like, what an awful way to live. What an awful way to live. You know, being obliged to go to church, otherwise you go to hell. Protestants don't live like that. We go to church because we want to. See the difference? That's freeing. 
And quite honestly, my brothers, this is why a lot of your friends and relatives fall away and go and join Protestant churches because they feel liberated from all of the rules. Well, that's because they never learned who God really is. All they've learned are these rules and regulations. These do's and don'ts. That's not love. You don't marry someone because they say, if you don't do this, and if you don't do this, and I want flowers twice a week, you better remember my birthday, and woe to you if you forget our anniversary, or I'm going to leave you, hate you, do this, do that. Well, what kind of relationship would that be? You know what I'm saying? I better do all these things, otherwise the missus is going to be mad at me. Well, my God, what kind of relationship? That's not love. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is. And, 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 and we laugh at this because it seems so silly. Yet this is how we relate to God. This is how we relate to God. We've got to change this. We've got to change this. Otherwise, uh, we, we are dooming ourselves because these lies will eventually eat us. They will destroy us. And even though they're a little, it, it got to get rid of it. And the only way to get rid of lies is to expose it by the truth. And where's the truth? Our church and our Lord. Our Lord is the truth, and he teaches his truth through our church. And the way that you know what our church says is true, look at the catechism. And I put you off. Tell me. Oh, I was just going to say that we cannot boast anything because everything belongs to God. Yes. Yes. We don't own anything here. Yes. Yes. Here on earth. Yes. Yes. Marvelous. If only we lived with that kind of detachment from the things of this world. That we are just stewards. God has given us a, a, a bit, and we are to use it to the best of our ability for His glory. We are to give it back to Him. Hmm? Does this sound familiar? Right? This is what Adam and Eve were supposed to do. God gave them the whole world. And what were they supposed to do with it? Exploit it? Build palaces for themselves and, and just live? Like, no, what were they supposed to do? Give it back to God. 